presents Crossroads with Pastor Isaac J. Kumar. Ask God's presence to fill us. We are in His presence this morning. We have, I believe, come to meet with Jesus and hear His voice and experience His touch, a fresh anointing. I hope that you have come here this morning with that expectation. I know that the scripture says it's not about the place. You can be all by yourself in the middle of a jungle and you can connect with God. You can like call out to him and he comes to your rescue. He speaks to you. He speaks to us. But corporate worship is another thing that God has instructed us. He says, do not give up meeting together as a church. And when we come together, I believe God has a way of dealing with us and speaking to us and bringing in that fellowship in being part of this spiritual family. Let's just ask the Lord this morning to speak to us and to fill us afresh this morning as we begin this morning, service. Lord, we come before your throne of grace this morning. I pray, O oh God, that this would not just be like another Sunday morning service. I pray that you do something new, something marvelous, a remarkable work in our lives this morning. We pray that every scheme of the enemy that comes in the way of coming closer to you would be removed in Jesus' name. We pray that the schemes of the evil one be defeated in Jesus' name. I pray for everyone who is here and everyone who is on their way. I pray, O oh God, that this would be a day of rejoicing, a day of celebration in your presence, a day of deliverance, because your word promises us that there is freedom in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray that you take complete control. Be glorified, be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name. Come, let us worship. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are. To worship, come just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now one day one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart oh come just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. Let's turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 7. We're doing a sermon series in the Gospel of Mark. And I am at Mark chapter 7, but there's a small portion of Mark chapter 6 that I uh, did not touch upon. At the end of it, verse 53, 
when they had crossed over they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there and when they came out of the boat immediately people recognized him they ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was verse 56 wherever he entered into villages, cities, or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might not just touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. So many ran to Jesus because of the miracles that they saw. As much as there were people trying to make up their minds as to who Jesus was, as I mean, we see that even today. There are people who love to receive the miracles that Jesus does even today. They want to get healed. They go to those healing crusades and what happens to many of them, many of them who go up to those uh, podiums, I mean they, they go up to the stage and like testify saying I came to this meeting with a headache or a backache or whatever other illness and then they say like today Jesus healed me. I mean if, if that is the intensity and uh, the proportion with which people are being healed in those healing crusades for the past 2000 years, India should have been saved. But where are all those people who received those miracles? Which tells us that there are people who love to come to Jesus just for those miracles. And then they get back to their old ways. They get back to their old religion. They get back to their old ways of sinful lifestyles. So, likewise, you see over here, when they heard that Jesus was in town, they all ran to him. They received their healing. But you don't get to hear about many of them, including even the twelve. If you see towards the end, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was caught by those Roman soldiers, I mean, they even abandoned him. So it tells us, or rather probably makes us think as to where we stand in our relationship with Jesus, in our following of Jesus. Are we just like a crowd that goes behind Jesus for the goodies that he gives you, for the good salary that he gives you, for the good job that he gives you, for helping you to pass your exams? Jesus, my exams are approaching. Please, Lord, help me to pass. And after that, he's forgotten. You're back to old ways, sinful lifestyle. Don't care about Jesus. Maybe in the midst of your friends you say, I don't know who you're talking about, but right now in this present party that I am, I drink. I speak foul language. Yeah, I prayed for my exams and he helped me to clear. That kind of faith most people in India have. They don't have a problem with including, including Jesus as one amongst the pantheon of gods. Are you also one among them? Who says, yeah, I have Jesus for my exams. I have somebody else for my wealth. I have somebody else for some, whatever other reasons. What God is expecting from us is that he would be your only personal Lord and Savior. Not just to get rid of your sins and so that you would make your way to heaven. But he needs to be your Lord, your master who dictates everything to you. Who tells you which way to turn, whether to speak this or not, whether to be in a particular place or not. Just moving on to chapter 7 and verse 1 following. I've entitled this sermon as True Purity. If we can go to that uh, slide. True purity. Let's read this passage, uh, a few verses from this passage. Chapter 7 begins like this. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. So when they, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is unwashed hands, they found fault with Jesus' disciples. Verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands. Anybody there? In a special way, holding the tradition of the elders, verse 4, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Like, isn't, isn't that like an important question in life? I mean, they're like so curious. That's like a serious problem for the Pharisees and the scribes. Why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? By that standard, many of us would be disqualified because we don't mind. But they are Pharisees. So yeah, to you and me, it may not seem like a big deal. The first thing that I see over here, or maybe I'd like to raise over here as I read this passage is, are you holding on to human traditions? Are you holding on to human traditions? Maybe one more slide, uh, the next one. Yeah, are you holding on to human traditions? And I'm sure you'll be able to relate with the picture there. 
and that got popularized two years ago. What do we notice over here? These Pharisees and Jewish leaders had already become hostile towards Jesus and were waiting for an opportunity to find fault with him. And when you're waiting for an opportunity to find fault with somebody, you could just like pick on anything. That's what they call as nitpicking. And they've come all the way from Jerusalem to do this. They found fault with his disciples now. So, okay, they couldn't find a fault with Jesus. I said, like, your friends, Jesus, is this who you call your friends, the sinners, the tax collectors, and this group of disciples, fishermen? They don't even wash their hands before eating. I mean, why does that matter so much to these people? They are eating with unwashed hands. More than just that, their accusation was that, that these people transgressed the tradition of the elders. That was what was bothering them. Verse 5. Why are they making such a big issue about it? For that, we need to understand some Jewish cultural background. We see in Hebrew hand washing, it is called, it is called uh, netilot yadim. Okay, that's like a Hebrew word for washing hands. The basis for hand washing in Judaism was originally related to the temple service and sacrifices and it comes from the Torah in Exodus chapter 30 and verses 17 to 21. You read about washing your hands. Where do you read about it? In what context? The tabernacle was built. God gave certain specifications about how the tabernacle uh, was supposed to be built. And outside, before you entered into the tabernacle, you had a labor, a, a basin of water. And the priests had to wash their hands and feet perhaps before they entered into the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle back in the Old Testament was considered as the, the dwelling place of God. Between the cherubim, the Ark of the Covenant. And so it was like a localized presence of God for the people to understand. I mean people don't understand when you say like God is everywhere. He is right here in our midst. So they are asking you like where is God? So for that sake kind of a thing, for the Israelites at least at that point of their journey with God and their faith, God's presence was in, in a way localized in that sense in the Ark of the Covenant, above the Ark of the Covenant. So when the cloud lifted up, I mean they knew that God's presence was going before them. When the cloud stopped, they said like, okay, God's presence says like, let's stay over here, let's stay over here and pitch the tents. So for this, I mean they had the outer courts and then they had the Holy of Holies. And for the priests, if they had to go in and offer sacrifices, they had to be ritually pure and clean. And so they had a basin of water. So that's where the washing of hands kind of a background comes from. It was for the priests. This was instructed, instructed for the priests to serve in the temple, who approach, to approach God in an appropriate manner with all holiness. God demanded bo bodily purity as well when they came before him to worship him. The failure to hand washing... Um, is tied to the possibility of death in the passage in Exodus. Basically means that anyone who approached a holy God in an un unholy manner would immediately be struck dead. That was how serious God was. Leviticus 11.44 We have a recent, I mean as I mentioned in that picture, a recent resurgence of this ritualistic hand washing as, as we saw around the time of COVID. They taught you how to wash your hands because of the, the virus and things like that. So Jesus was confronting their traditions. The question here that comes to us this morning is, are we holding on to traditions? Traditions can kill the spirit, yield to the Holy Spirit and be set free. A tradition is a belief or practice that has been around for so long that no one has questioned, but Jesus questioned it because false traditions take you away from God and salvation. Our ultimate authority in spiritual and religious matters must be Jesus and his word. So he is talking about such Traditions, are you holding on to such traditions? Because traditions can take you away from God and salvation Our sometimes. Our ultimate authority in spiritual and religious matters must be Jesus and his word. For that matter, let me come to the other side. Sometimes we hold on to what we call as infant baptism. It's a tradition. It's not there in scripture. The Bible tells us that you got baptized only when a person knew Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior had had a proper transformation experience confessing their sins. Their life is remarkably changed like Zacchaeus who was a greedy, I mean man. Now suddenly Jesus came to his house, his life is totally transformed, gave away all of his money. There's a remarkable change. After that, 
kind of a salvation experience it is only to those who believed in the lord jesus to be their personal lord and savior they got they gave baptism in the new testament not to babies so that's a tradition so if you weigh tradition against scripture which one would you give more importance to would you say no this is how our church tradition is or would you be willing to listen to god's word that says like there's no some, there's no thing like baptizing an infant because the, ch the child does not know that he's a sinner he or she is a sinner the child cannot like repent for their sins when it, when we say infant we are talking about a baby who's like few months old a child maybe of 3 years or 4 years of age can make sense of what is right and what is wrong but we are talking about infants that's why it's called as infant baptism so what you did back then i mean neither is there this practice of sprinkling that's another tradition so if you ask me the question like which one would you want to i mean like give importance to tradition or the word of god that says they went into the water jesus himself the son of god went to the river jordan john the baptist tries to stop him he says let me never mind let all righteousness be fulfilled you need to baptize me right now he goes to the river and gets bap baptized by immersion that's the kind of thing i'm talking about so i hope you get my point are we stuck to traditions jesus says come out of those things and he says like don't be so stuck to it just because you've done it like this all through what matters is your heart the second thing that we see over here is are you wearing a religious mask jesus looks at those disciples i mean those pharisees and those scribes were six he says he answered them and said well did isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me and in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men these are the words of isaiah 29 and verse 13 these people honor me with their lips jesus was calling them that up front he was saying this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me in vain they worship me in vain they're worshiping him they're going to church they're playing the tambourines they're taking their sacrifice with them the pigeons and the lambs but jesus is saying and so also did isaiah back in the old testament in vain they worship me their songs amount to nothing it is all lips lip service i mean like just not from within in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men for laying aside the commandment of god you hold the tradition of men the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things jesus was calling these pharisees you hypocrites you yourself don't practice these things and yet you are trying to impose it on these people you are making So you are like majoring on the minors like they say those traditions of the rabbis does not have the same authority as the word of god as the torah but you seem to be picking on the disciples for something simple like this it's not even god's word about the washing of hands okay washing of hands is like a good thing like good practice good hygiene but you cannot call that a sin and like accuse people of that when there are much serious things that you have in your lives so he says like get rid of your mask the religious mask the religious mask that appears to be like a christian and when you come close and they observe your life you don't see christian traits and qualities and decision making and and all of that jesus uses the word hypocrites 23 times in the new testament out of which 21 times he uses it against the religious leaders the legalistic and the religious folk the fifth commandment says he goes on to quote as to how they are transgressing in the bigger things the fifth commandment says honor your father and mother is that like a complicated commandment that requires like explanation interpretation and like commentary on it honor your father and mother as simple as that the new testament also says the same thing jesus says the same thing to this young man who comes to him and asks him what's the way to eternal life and he tells him all of these things follow all the commandments honor your father and mother but the pharisees i mean jesus says where what is jesus saying over here he said all too well you reject the commandment of god verse 9 and that you may keep the tradition for moses said honor your father and mother and he who curses father or mother let him be put to death anybody here who curses father or mother I hope you will repent today because it has serious consequences. If you go to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6, it says this is the only commandment with a promise. Honor your father and mother so that your days might be long. 
so that you might be blessed. If you don't honor your parents, obviously you're going to be losing your blessings. It's not like an old fashioned thing, an outdated commandment. It stands true even today. And those of you who have honored your father and mother, you will see that the blessing of the Lord is upon your lives. But the Pharisees, they had a clever way of working around it. The tradition of the elders said, you could get around, I mean, honoring your father and mother means like you need to take care of them. Am I right? What does honoring your father, father and mother mean? Obey your parents. I mean, like Jesus himself was submissive to his parents until a certain point of time when he began doing ministry. He was with his parents, listened to everything, every instruction that they gave. Honoring your parents involves like taking care of them when they are old, not like sending them to an old age home. Just because we have the money, you may have the money. You may find it difficult to get them into their adult diapers and take care of them. But they did that for you when you were a child, when you dirtied the place. I'm just playing, speaking plain, okay? Because this is like a Western culture that tells you, like, no, uh, I think like we need to send them to an old age home. We've got people over there, we've got facilities over there. Air conditioned room, daddy. Oh well. They want your companionship, your fellowship, and like talking to you. So Jesus was saying, like, you guys are picking on unwashed hands before eating. What about this? This is like a direct law. Honor your father and mother is a direct law. Washing hands is a tradition. You're not following the main thing. So he said, like, come on, guys, tear off that mask, that religious mask that you're wearing. And pretending to be like a Pharisee, a law-abiding Jew, pretending to be like a Christian, but it's not so much in your practice, you're transgressing bigger things. You're saying you go to church, you're saying you read the Bible, but it's not there in your real life. Your hearts are far from God. That's what he was saying. Thirdly, and quickly, let me just conclude with the last thing over here. It says, stay clear of heart pollution. Verse 13, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down that, and many su such things you do. Verse 14, when he, called, when he had called all the multitudes to himself, he said, Hear me, everyone, and understand that nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 17, when he had entered a house away from the crowds, his disciples asked him and con concerning the parable. And so he said to them, Are you without understanding also? Do you not perceive whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? Verse 20, and he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. And look at the list of things he gives. This is what pollutes you much more than washing of hands. That's what Jesus was trying to point out to them. Adulteries. Verse 21. Fornications. Is there a difference? Yes, there's a difference. Adultery, ma extramarital affair, I mean outside of marriage, flirting with people who are not your wife. And if you thought it was just flirting and just like casual, like humor pastor, this is like my colleague pastor, I just like joke around with her. Well, it doesn't work like that in Jesus' description. That slight humor and joking might sometimes get into some other stuff. And he says, like, if, even if you've looked at a woman with lust, or a man with lust, for that matter, he says, you've committed adultery. So, he says, fornication, you know what fornication is. What's the modern term for fornication? Somebody who's been in church for some time. Modern word for fornication? Shall I wait till I get the answer? You have many fancy words for that. Let me explain it to you. Cohabitation. Live in relationship. That's what Jesus meant when he said fornication. You're not married but have loose relationships, casual relationships with everybody. Multiple partners sometimes without getting married. And so they have a nice name for it. Cohabitation and live in relationships. Jesus is talking about that, my friend, this morning. If God is speaking to you, he says, like, get rid of that. Stay clear of heart pollution. Adulteries, fornications, murders, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye. 
blasphemy pride foolishness all these evils come from within this is what defiles a man that's what jesus meant when he said in the sermon on the mount he just like took it on to a different plane altogether you guys talk about adultery and murder only when the act is committed even if you did it in your thought he says you've already committed what about that mr mr pharisee a preacher i mean like one of the preachers i heard said people today are so concerned about air pollution noise pollution water pollution the whole world is rallying around it what about heart pollution what about heart pollution jesus is calling us to true purity it's not about outward washing of hands it's not about just like looking prim and proper and going to church on sunday morning it's not about having a christian name he says get rid of those traditions get rid of that religious mask beware of i mean stay clear of heart pollution because defilement comes from within as we bow our heads this morning let's ask the holy spirit to search our hearts a large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver but also wood and clay some indeed for honorable use others for common use paul says in second timothy 2:21 So if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit he will be a vessel for honor sanctified useful to the master prepared for every good work in the same context and in line he says verse 22 free from flee from youthful lusts passions and pursue righteousness faith love and peace together with those who call on the lord out of a pure heart Jesus this morning we pray and submit ourselves into your hands forgive us for the times when we have held on to traditions and have beat it down upon others yet when we ourselves have not been able to follow it forgive us for the times when we o lord o master held on to traditions but our hearts were far away from you i encourage those of you if the lord is speaking to you do not let go of this opportunity do not let go of this moment repent of your sin be it traditions be it a religious mask that you have been wearing or be it any one of these things listed out by Jesus which pollutes the heart he says your heart matters more than your outward appearance your heart matters more than those ceremonial hand washing and only Jesus and his blood can cleanse you of this sin We pray for everyone who's gathered here for service this morning. I pray that you bless them. Keep us under your care and your protection until we meet again. To you belongs all the glory, honor and praise. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.